Hello everyone and welcome to the second Wood Elf Guide video. Uh, this section we're going to focus on in-game tactics and strategy um, and it is recorded using in-game video footage. Uh, in this video I cover the following examples. Uh, we've got defensive setups, we've got offensive setups, uh, we've got how to score quickly uh, in various different uh, against various different defences, uh, we've got how to screen off the ball um, and how to screen off and prevent them uh, attacking and we've also got uh, how you then translate that into applying pressure and ultimately potentially how to turn that into a ball sacking opportunity and be able to steal the ball. Uh, right now we're going to look at some defensive setups for a Wood Elf team. Uh, the defensive setup you've got on the screen right now is generally considered uh, to be one of the safer and more secure setups for Wood Elves uh, and also one that you're looking to score over the course of about eight turns. Um, and this is a generic five players in the centre of the line of scrimmage uh, looking to get your blocks off and then you've got two players on this side and two players on this side. So if a blitz happened to you, um, what would happen is that they need to have to run round uh, the side or they can blitz this player or this player, but they can't actually dodge through. Notice how this guy and this guy, if you took this player out, would be causing them to dodge through a tackle zone. If you took this guy out, he's got to still run all the way around the edge um, and only a combination of a really short kick to somewhere in this one of these squares on this side or this side um, and a blitz would put you into a bit of trouble. So it's nice and safe. It comes at the cost of not being able to put an awful lot of pressure down one of the flanks. Um, but if you're doing for an eight turn drive, you're actually not that fussed about that. Um, what we've also done just for a little bit of additional um, bonus points is I put the thrower here and the catcher here. And so uh, in the first turn, hopefully the thrower can go and find the ball and fetch it from wherever it is, pick it up and throw it to the catcher uh, to generate a star player point. Very important in league play or ladder play. Um, and then potentially, depending on the rest of the turn would go, you might actually hand it back to the thrower and do the same in turn two, same in turn three, um, and keep going until the thrower actually levels up just by throwing, uh, throwing the ball. So this particular setup we've got here uh, is for a Wood Elf team that wants to go and score relatively quickly, but wants to not put themselves at risk uh, against the blitz kickoff result. Uh, it also would work quite well against the perfect defense result because you're still quite wide. Um, first of all, let's look at the strengths of this. So if a blitz happens and he takes out this player here or this player here, uh, or indeed one of the two edge players, he can't actually get through because your secondary second row is providing lots of tackle zones. Um, if he takes out one of the edge players, he's still got to run all the way around. So that's fine. Um, but at the same time, we've actually got one, two, three, four, five players who are directly able to go and attack one of the flanks. Um, and these three can go and attack the other flank. Uh, and these two players will also be able to then just swing off the line of scrimmage and pick on one of these two edge players, depending on what you choose to do. Um, we have sacrificed the ability to generate a star player point easily. So the catcher has now gone, as you can see here. Um, but the thrower is slightly further back in the backfield. Um, if you notice, he's actually six squares. So he's one behind the centre square, just in case there's a slightly deeper kick, because he's close to the kick to run forward and throw it, throw it up. Um, so that's the second setup. So this is the third offensive setup for Wood Elves, and this is a very more this is a bit more of an aggressive variant of the same one uh, that you just saw, because it's actually now more at risk of getting a blitz. And in fact, if you do get blitz, this player is likely to go down, um, and he's able to flood through. However, uh, if you do need to go and press down one side, you've got all your players over on that side, and you'll be able to put an awful lot of pressure in and probably score in two turns uh, with very little effort. So. Um, just consider your risk reward. This will have more reward, but it does come at a slightly higher risk. On two. All right, hello everyone. Uh, you join us here uh, as the Wells look to try and score a two-turn touchdown um, with relative safety, and they um, are going to make it so they're going to roll as few dice as possible and make sure that the ball is basically unsackable. We will now watch how this uh, is set up. Uh, this is a very good thing if you want to score uh, late in the half or if you're feeling super confident that you can turn your opponent over. Um, this is a very good way of scoring two turns. And let's see how how do we do it. Um, what we're trying to achieve, um, sort of strategy-wise, uh, will be that the ball will be in scoring range next turn and that the ball carrier, whoever it's going to be, cannot then get uh, directly blitzed or ideally um, nothing more than based uh, but from behind so you can just walk it in uh, and score the following turn. Now I'm just going to pause it here already because what we've done here was we've actually um, set up the beginnings of uh, the screen. So I've not rolled any dice yet 
And what we've got here is the two players that were on this side have run round over to here to, to uh, fill in these squares here. And then the flanking players here, instead of charging straight down the line, uh, the line have actually cut inside uh, and gone here. Uh, and this shape here that we've got means that uh, if this guy is blitzed and you know, knocked over and falls there, he can't get these players around across here. Uh, if this guy is removed, he can't get players through. So they are forming a screen to stop these players, these six players here, getting into these squares about here. Because um, for a two-turn score, what he's going to want to do is block your route to be able to score. So that's what they're doing. Um, now let's see how we, we sort of further strengthen that. So the next couple of players are to now start screening off where the ball carrier is going to go. Uh, notice we haven't committed absolutely everybody just yet, just in case we roll a double one. So, ball is passed um, from thrower to catcher. Now we've got the ball somewhere secure. And now you can see that what we've managed to do uh, is make it so the catcher can run straight forward. And already these pieces are now looking a lot stronger. Uh, and you can see why they're there. We're not finished yet. Um, but that's what they're doing. So we are starting to set up a cage around the ball carrier and then a screen around that cage. I'll let the rest of this carry on through. So now if we now, other than rolling a dice that we had to roll to get the ball onto the ball carrier, uh, now if this dodge fails, it's not the end of the world. Uh, he's going to struggle to be able to get to the ball um, and on a human team. Going into there, dodging to there's a 5+, plus, dodging to there's a 4+, plus, dodging out to 3+, plus for two dice on the ball. It's not ideal, but um, you'd like to think that it's pretty safe. So what we do now is make it so that, that dodge, um, just pause that for a second, that dodge is now not possible. Um, and on a human team, dodging through here, um, well that's a 6 plus, that's a 6 plus, and that's 2 dice uphill. Uh, sorry, that's 1 dice. So 6 plus, 6 plus, that's pretty pretty safe. Um, and then we make the last roll here, uh, and the point of putting this player here is that he could potentially have tagged out the war dancer and then taken on the four plus dodge, the five plus dodge for two dice on the ball. Uh, what he's doing there is he's making that a four plus dodge, a four plus dodge, a four plus dodge, a five plus dodge. Um, and so you sort of get the point uh, of why that's so difficult. Now, this then is going to be that the catcher runs in. Just to, to round that off, what we're trying to achieve and what you are trying to achieve when you're trying to set up a two turn score uh, is the following. The ball carrier needs to be somewhere completely safe. The ball carrier needs to be in th inside, ideally, uh, a screen. If you've got any remaining players, you then need to start screening off the space that your opponent wants to run into. So notice these these four here would be classed as part of the screen for the second, uh, the, the last thing, whereas these players are screening off the ball carrier. Uh, and this player is also screening off um, the, the, where he might choose to run. So. Um, that shows you how it can be done, and it's a little bit of it's insight as to what you're trying to achieve as well. Okay. Right, in the first video you saw us score a two-turn touchdown when your opponent left the flank completely open, and it was pretty easy really. While some of the points I raised were, were important, um, it really wasn't that difficult to do. So what I've decided to do now is we've um, increased the difficulty by a notch, and I'm going to try and score a two-turn touchdown, um, but with your opponent defending both of the flanks. Now, in this particular video, I do have to roll a few more dice and things could go, go wrong. Um, but the, the points, again, will be uh, pretty important to try and follow through. So uh, in this particular video, what we're going to try and do now uh, is set up so that we've got the ball, carrier, ball on the ball carrier around here inside a cage. And so that the following turn, we are, let's say we are here, we're attacking all of this from here to here because you can run along a diagonal or you can run anywhere forwards so it's quite important that we try and get the ball in here um, and we try and prevent as much as possible the players getting round from the flanks to be able to get in our way so let's see how we do this the first block here was with a war dancer um, we do get a knockdown that's quite helpful not required but quite helpful uh, we also get a removal so we're now going to try and move this guy out of the way. Um, a knockdown would again would be, would be nice, but it's not required. So if we can knock this guy over, um, we're going to try and put him in this square here. It means that we can then walk through these squares here. So we can come through here and come through here without any tackle zones. If we, do get the, if we don't get a knockdown, it's just simply a push. 
then we'll be dodging through on twos because we can walk into this square here. So that's the player to take out. Um, unfortunately, uh, the ogre is too strong, so we can't go after the other side. If our opponent had chosen to uh, put strength four players there or we hadn't got a way of knocking these over, then we'd start relying on having to knock over all of the line of scrimmage before we can do anything. And so you'd be trying to knock diagonally across on the line of scrimmage and then flood through afterwards. Uh, but in this scenario, because we're playing against humans, uh, it is possible. Next thing to do is we do want to try and blitz with the ward answer. So uh, the thrower is going to go and pass the ball to the ward answer. Ball is now on ward answer. And we're quite lucky we cause a casualty. Uh, it doesn't matter if that was just a push. It doesn't matter. Um, but since we are streaming, we've got streamer dice. So now they've got the ball carrier there. Uh, and if you notice in the first video, we hardly had to roll any dice at all. I've already had to roll a bunch of dice to get um, to a scoring position. You could argue potentially you might want to start sticking the screen up first. Because if you fail one of the dice critically, you won't be able to score. So potentially you might want to start sending players through. Um, but I decided to do it this way. So now it's start building up the cage. Same principle as before, trying to put the ball inside uh, a cage so it is difficult for him to do anything to us. A slightly different principle uh, is that the cage will be a slightly looser cage than the last time because whenever whatever cage point he attacks, if we've got a slightly looser cage, it is actually then easier to be able to um, dodge sideways or backwards uh, first. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. I'm trying to set up a bit of a looser cage. Uh, and again, from the first video, you might recognize this move, which is to try and stop players getting around uh, and getting in front of us. And uh, it's the same move from here. Um, these last couple of moves were nice to have rather than required, uh, because this cage here was uh, good enough. So you can see the human team starting to try and respond to that. Um, ultimately, it doesn't work, so I won't play out the rest of it. Um, but that would mean that we've then got an away to get in to score. Um, so that's how you would try and set up a, a looser screened uh, two-tone touchdown if your opponent defends the wide zones. So now we're going to cover some defensive setups uh, and this is for Wood Elves. Now first of all before we actually set up um, and, and I show you some of the defensive setups you want to understand the strategy behind what creates a good defensive setup for Wood Elves and then you can apply that to your own situations in your own games. Um, the first thing is that Wood Elves are one of the most fastest and most mobile teams um, in Blood Bowl. So the way that they will be able to capitalise and strengthen the opponent um, is to be able to try and pull your opponent out of position. Now, the very first thing you might want to try and do um, on, on opponent drive is to try and split the team. So take the players that are on his line of scrimmage or their line of scrimmage and the players that are near the ball and try and get in between the two sets of players effectively, uh, meaning that you can try and then leverage your team and put some pressure on the ball carrier and maybe steal before he's got the ball completely safe. Now, to do that, um, what you want to do is you want the ball over in one area uh, of the field, probably further back, uh, somewhere in the backfield over here, and you want his team to be in one side or the other. So an offset line of scrimmage really, really helps you here. Um, so if we just let the replay happen for a second, uh, we will then see uh, an offset line of scrimmage. And the first thing that an offset line of scrimmage will do uh, is it, instead of meaning that he gets his five players set up on the line of scrimmage to counter your three, normally you go for five, um, being in one, two, three, four, five squares, all central, um, it actually means he's got to move them off to one side. So they've now got some of the line of scrimmage area that's normally occupied, potentially to be able to run through, and from here all the way across to here is a big swathe of pitch that you can then rush through and send your players through um, and it can really help you open up the pitch. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason is if he does indeed put his five players, one, two, three, four, five, um, assuming that he's going to look for the diagonal blocks, then these squares, these two squares here, don't have anyone in front of them. So if you get a perfect defense, you can take these players and pick them on the other side and two of the three players don't get hit at all, and one of them can only get hit once, which is the guy that will be stood in this square to get hit from here. So you can damage mitigate, and you can uh, help um, enable and split the players 
uh, on the opposition team. What this particular offence has done, because Wood Elves are so fast, uh, is I've put all my fast players on one side. So if the kick is over here um, and he's looking to try and rush down the field, well, I can get back into position really quickly. If the kick is anywhere on this flank, um, all my fast players are able to go and pressure the ball immediately. Um, and I've pulled five of his players uh, over to one side. So um, that's the first setup. Uh, the next setup is the standard version of this uh, same play, which is you've got two, a two, a two, and a two. Uh, and what I'm doing here is hiding my more valuable players. So I've got the, the what answers at the back, um, and I'm not allowing any particular uh, pressure down the same side as the line of scrimmage, which is where his players are. But it's coming at the cost of being able to swing around on his side of the pitch. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is for a defensive setup where the turn marker might be a little bit further forward and you're actually trying to defend um, where you're, you're ahead and you're only trying to defend a couple of turns. Um, and this particular setup is very effective at defending if you've only got a couple of turns left. And it does work for all teams, but uh, especially does work for Wood Elves. Uh, and what I've done here is that by putting the line of scrimmage in the centre, uh, he's got to deal with them, he's got to throw blocks, he's potentially going to use his re-roll, he's got to move them out of the way and knock them over. And also, by having the players um, like this, um, if he blitzed this player here, for example, uh, he could bring the cage and he could bring it as far forward, he could put the ball here, um, but he wouldn't be able to get any further forward. If he blitzed this guy, yeah, he's going to push him into this square probably and he can end up here. But all of the Wood Elves are able to then go and respond to wherever the cage is, because he's likely to put the cage somewhere in this area here. And with the speed of the Wood Elves, you can go and deal with it. What you don't want to do is you don't want the cage to be all down one side with your players unable to get across, because even though they are movement seven, they can't get all the way across the field. And you don't want to give away the sideline, because if you do give away the sideline, he'll just put the ball on the sideline, put a screen around it, and the same way that we did the two-turn offence, um, th this is the counter to that particular offence. So this is a very useful one to have. Um, in your locker but you won't use it that often it's a very specific thing that you're looking for and you can actually see here that as I'm moving the players around to try and stop um, him coming through uh, through this square here it's I am unable to make it so he can't run around the sideline so if the one answer goes there and this guy goes there then you've still got that two plus dodge through and if you move this guy out of the way you can just walk into the end walk into here completely unopposed um, if I move the uh, the catcher forward you can just blitz uh, and push through and again the sideline is not defended it is defended however if you hold this square and this square meaning that these players on the sidelines are really not appealing targets so what you need to do with your defensive setups is consider what your opponent is trying to do and then use tackle zones as your friend to make it more difficult for them to get through So now we're going to um, show, I'm going to show you a little bit about um, how to screen as Wood Elves and how to slow down your opponent and put them under some pressure. Um, here we've got the same human team uh, and Wood Elf teams again, and it's midway through the half. The, the human team have managed to get the ball secure. So imagine this scenario is just that the human team are nice and secure. Your players are in your half, and yet you haven't really done anything. Uh, the first thing you want to try and do is slow down the opponent so they can't get lots of uh, squares forward or yardage. Um, over the course of the next couple of turns and what I'm doing here is building a standard column defense so I've put line elves at the front um, and then I'm putting positionals behind and if you notice here that we've got um, each player is two squares apart from the next one and there's also someone stood up stood directly behind them and the reason for that is that if the human player wants to progress um, they can blitz one of the front players. They could even then, using their superior strength in some places, push into the player behind uh, and base him up, but they wouldn't then be able to get any further forward. So they're only getting uh, a couple of squares a turn. And here in this scenario, it's turn four. So the human coach would get to this square and then be able to blitz this guy out of the way. Uh, and then the front of the cage would be here. Uh, the next turn, this guy has dodged back a square and you've gone back a square and you've gained a couple of squares. So that's turn five you're here, turn six, you're here, turn seven, you're here, uh, and you've still got an awful long way to go, and so you're not going to be able to score. So while you've got 11 elves on the field, you can 
um, just frustrate your opponent and make it so they can't score um, just using a simple column defense. Um, and this is a very good way of winding down the clock. You should also consider that you want your players to not be in base contact at all, so not taking any hits. So now we join uh, the game, same game on turn six. The human coach has advanced a little bit down the field, but is a long way from the end zone. Um, he has managed to keep the ball completely safe, so it's inside a cage, uh, and it's also again uh, inside an anti-leap cage because I can't cancel the player out stood behind the ogre, so it would be two dice on the ball carrier. However, because it's now turn six, um, our human coach is probably feeling a little bit strained. Uh, he's only got three turns to get the ball from the end zone uh, down here. The Wood Elf team is also uh, still at 11 players. And this is where you can actually then swap your column defense out and start playing a little bit more aggressively um, and create something for yourself. So what I've done is I've already moved one of my column players uh, and based the back cage corner. I have brought a couple of players around the back so we can start really threatening the cage. Um, this, however, is then not done at the expense of uh, my screen. So I am just finishing off my screen and making it nice and safe. And uh, what I probably should have done was actually bring the, uh, the, the thrower through here uh, and just stand in that square there. Uh, but now by basing uh, the ball carrier, I got lucky on the KO, um, but by basing the ball carrier, I'm meaning making it so he's got to make it, use his blitz here and he can't then use the blitz on the front end of the screen. So taking the ball forward next turn, this is going to find that very challenging. Um, with four players forward, one of which specifically being the catcher, if the ball does go free, uh, the catcher is able to just pick the ball, yeah, hand the ball off to him with a re-roll, because we might have used it earlier in the turn, and then run all eight squares forward um, and the ball will be gone. So just consider where that catcher is for a second and it is a key player. And because the human coach has only got three turns left, um, this is where you start to see the cage fragment a little bit uh, in a normal game, and they will then start to push forwards. So Ward Answer, fortunately for me, doesn't go down. Um, and the human coach does make a slight, um, uh, a slight issue there um, and doesn't make that two dice. It was possible to make it two dice. Um, but let's just consider for a second... Um, that he's now got to move the ball into a standard X-shaped cage because he needs to have some scoring threats. Um, and uh, he's concerned that if he doesn't have any scoring threats, he's going to move the ball forward. He's going to lose the ball and not be able to score. So now we've got turn seven. And with turn seven, now that the humans have come forward because they've had to, because you haven't allowed them uh, the yardage to get forward already, they start fragmenting and the cages become easier to deal with just because of the way that the human coach is approaching things. Um, what we're then gonna do is we're gonna try and leap into the cage and with one dice, sack the ball and um, run away with it. Uh, important things to try and note here um, that the way that we cancel the assists out for the cage, cage corners is actually very important that we don't just leave it with um, one, one tackle zone on one player because when the ball hopefully goes on the floor, we don't want one of the cage corners to catch it. Now they're agility three, so they catch a bouncing ball naturally on a four. Um, if you can put them in two tackle zones, they count the ball on a six. So that means that the ball potentially could land on this blitzer here, for example. And then because he's on a six, he's unlikely to catch it. It then bobbles again in any of these eight squares here around the blitzer, which hopefully lands sort of here. Then it's just in one tackle zone and you can walk off with it and pick it up uh, and hand it off to the catcher on a simple three plus. So Although the ball starts being in the cage, you're almost looking for the ball to land on one of the cage corners, then drop it, and then it land outside the cage and it become a very easy recovery. And to do that, you need to put all the cage corners um, on a uh, into two tackle zones. So he's now in two tackle zones, he's in two tackle zones. <coughs> that one's now in two tackle zones. The only one that I might not want to put into two tackle zones is the ogre. Um, however, we are blitzing from here, uh, we're going to leap in from behind, and that means that the ball is now going to fall into this square, um, and note, note, where it's good, note where it potentially could fall, so it's going to land in any of these eight squares here, um, and if you just go through the squares in, in total, so not a great square for us, but not terrible, that's a pretty good square for us, because it's in three tackle zones, he's not going to catch it, and it would then fall in one of these eight squares, maybe out here, and if it landed on 
Uh, this square, that's not too bad, but we're not likely to catch it because I've double tackle zoned us. So he's now catching the ball on a five, which is not what you don't want them to catch the ball. Um, that one's a great square for us. That one's not a bad square for us. That's a bad square. So there are only two bad squares and there are sort of six pretty good squares um, for us to have. So the odds are in our favour. And as it transpires, the ball actually landed in one tackle zone, uh, which was great. Catch it goes in, picks up the ball, dodges out on a two, um, and you can walk over and hand it off to this catcher, who then is able to run off uh, and hand the ball off. Um, because I recorded the re replay really late at night and I was very tired, I didn't actually hand the ball off there. Uh, but let's just pretend just for a second uh, that I did, and uh, the catcher then would run forward um, and be completely screened and the ball would be completely safe and it'd be gone. So that's how you can transition from screen defense um, in the early turns into a pressed defense uh, and then create the conditions for a leap ball sack um, later in the half. Putting that aside, there is of course the other way of doing things, which is that you've got two ward answers. You're able to leap in on the uh, first couple of turns and you can try and sack and if things go wrong, you've got another one a little bit later in the half. Just for you um, coaches who are a little bit more um, aggressive, you do have to accept that when you leap in and cause yourself a turnover, if it does go wrong, that your opponent is likely to be able to get the ball um, further forward and then you're giving away the opportunity of the screening defense. So you are then having to commit to that other attack uh, with the other award answer if you don't lose one, uh, if you do lose one uh, later in the half. So just consider your strategy uh, in terms of what you want to do and how you want to achieve it, okay? Hello everyone, I just wanted to round out the video uh, with a couple of thank yous um, and a couple of acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, uh, thank yous. Um, I wanted to say thank you very much to Andre for creating that stunning intro video you see at the start of this video and also uh, of part one of the guide. Um, say thank you very much to Big Burly Bob who was my um, winning associate uh, as the human coach uh, throughout all of this content in this video. Um, I wanted to say thank you very much to Zunk and LD Dorino um, as without their constant chivying uh, and chasing me over the last couple of weeks we probably wouldn't have got this finished. Um, and to acknowledge that this has taken a little bit of time to produce, um, maybe slightly longer than I first anticipated when we start talking about guide videos. Um, and then uh, also just to uh, acknowledge uh, in, in video format now that this video could well have been probably 10, 20 hours long uh, if I'd have gone through all the different defensive setups and all the different offensive setups um, and all the different ways of scoring uh, in only a couple of turns. But what I've tried to do is just give you a bit of a flavour of how you can score, uh, for example, with a wide zone shut down or how you can score uh, if the wide zones are left open and what difference that makes. Um, so you can consider that on both on your defence and uh, on your offence. Um, and I've also uh, shown you some of uh, the diff different defensive setups and a little bit of why um, so you can make your own defensive setups uh, as I acknowledge that there are at least probably several thousand potential um, both defensive and offensive setups out there. So thank you very much for taking the time to uh, to watch this. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like so we can uh, other people can find it on YouTube. And um, if you do want to see um, some of what we've discussed in action, then the team that's actually on screen now was the team that I played in um, Blood Bowl 2's Champion Ladder uh, series in last season. And this is the statistics that the team uh, managed. So 18-3-2, uh, it's somewhere north of an 80% win rate. So it can be done. Um, if you want to see the link to that playlist, uh, if you want to see that playlist, um, then just check the comment section below as it will have uh, that link in there. Um, so all that remains is thank you very much for watching. I've been Andy Davo, you've been the viewer. Um, we'll see you next time. Cheers, folks.